Well, several years ago, way back in the old 1990s, uh, some dear friends of ours uh, from college were missionaries in Hungary. And we had been friends together in university, and then they went off as missionaries. My wife and I did other things, but we stayed in contact. And at some point, when they came back from Hungary on a furlough, they brought me a pretty cool present that I still have in my office. And it's a poster. It's a poster in a sort of 19th century style. The people seem to be wearing uh, 19th century clothing. And it's clearly trying to communicate an image. This is not just a, a landscape or a seascape or something or a building. This is a, a picture that's telling a story and trying to say something to us very clearly. And, this, and it's written in Hungarian, which makes it pretty cool as well. I don't speak Hungarian. But it's really clear, even if you don't speak Hungarian, what this, this picture is doing. And it's, it's oriented up and down. And this picture is kind of split into two parts. And on one side, kind of three-fourths of the, of the poster depicts a bunch, a bunch of little vignettes. People doing different things like... Uh, gambling and maybe visiting a brothel and, uh, you know, doing bad things, playing cards, dog fighting, um, you know, some kid like spinning one of those big hoops or something, whatever they did in the 19th century, I don't know what that was, but there's all these crazy people doing all these apparently bad things. And if you let your eyes go naturally up the picture on that side, you'll see that the end of it gets bigger and bigger and then there's this burning fire with winged demons flying around. On the other side, the smaller part of the picture is these little 19th century depictions, people in 19th century clothing, doing all these good things, going to church and being nice to each other and sharing their lunch and whatever it else is. And it's really small and it gets smaller and smaller. There's a church somewhere on there and it gets smaller and smaller. And at the top of that side of the poster, there's a beautiful picture of the celestial city. And even though I don't speak Hungarian, and most of you probably don't either, you can probably imagine what verses are actually printed at the bottom of that poster, and indeed what it's trying to say. And it's in fact these verses that we have before us today, Matthew 7, 13, and 14, which talk about entering by the narrow gate, Jesus says, for easy and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and few are those who find it. But narrow and difficult is the narrow way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. <clears throat> now, I understand that poster, and I understand those verses, and I understand that the way that these verses have been read throughout most of Christian history is precisely in that way, that those verses are, in fact, being interpreted by this poster in a way that is true in a very real sense that there is a it's easy in some ways to live an ungodly life and it's easy to live this sort of loose life and we do know that those choices we make can lead to our destruction and there are difficulties certainly of, of living the Christian life and sacrifice involved and and we could call that a narrow way and and that way leads to eternal life and those choices we make matter but I want to suggest to you today that that's actually not what these verses are saying. As true as that is, I don't think that's what Matthew 7, 13, and 14, I don't think that's what Jesus is saying by these verses that are very well known to us about the narrow and broad way. And let me explain why that is. Now, my wife, Tracy, is a very skilled and creative artist, and her her medium is Italian glass tile. So she takes these beautiful, by themselves, little pieces of tile and she, she nips around their edges and shapes them and does different things to them. And in a way that I could never do, and I'm always amazed, she takes these different pieces that are beautiful in themselves and she creates a picture out of them that is so much more than the individual pieces. Well, I want to suggest to you that that's exactly what's going on with Matthew 7, 13, and 14, and really all of Scripture, isn't it? But that the Sermon on the Mount, of which these verses are found, is a beautiful, well-crafted mosaic that is a picture. It's saying something overall. It's communicating a picture even more powerful than that poster. And yet what we tend to do is we tend to just look at an individual piece of it 
and then not understand how it fits into the overall part. Or to use a slightly different metaphor, do you remember those things I remember reading like Ranger Rick magazine growing up or something where you had these uh, eye benders, I think they were called or something, where it was like a photo of something in real life that was so close up you couldn't see what it really was. Maybe it was a tractor tire or a doorknob or something. But you had to sort of get away from a little bit and then you could see what it was. Well, I want to suggest to you that when you pull back and look at the mosaic picture of Matthew 7, 13 and 14, and really the whole Sermon on the Mount, we'll see that what Jesus is saying there is actually even more powerful and more challenging than what that Hungarian poster would say Matthew 7, 13 and 14 is about. So if you have a Bible or you can listen along, but if you do, I'd like to ask you to actually turn back a couple chapters from chapter 7 and look at Matthew chapter 5. And I just want to do a really quick, what I like to call a cardiographic run over the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, when I preached in chapel a year and a half or so ago, I preached from Matthew chapter 6. And so if you remember that, some of you might have been here, some of the same point running up to this is to be seen. And again, it's, like, it's what I like to call a cardiographic reading of the sermon. So look with me first at Matthew chapter 5, where we begin the Sermon on the Mount with these very famous beatitudes, these pictures, these invitations to true life. These invitations to what it means to really live in a right relationship to God and a place of flourishing. These invitations that are ironic and unexpected because they involve suffering and, and difficulty and persecution even. But what's consistent about all these Beatitudes is that each of them are describing really what I like to call a posture of heart. If you look at these, these describe a way of being in the world that really focuses not just on our behaviors and our activities, but, by what, but on what kind of person we are, that we are poor in spirit, that we are mourning, especially that means mourning and longing for God's kingdom to come, that we're meek and humble, that we're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And it goes on, even the things that look like activities are things that come out of a heart, pure in heart, and making peace, being that kind of people. Those are all describing a way of being in the world that is Christ-centered, that focuses on the heart. And then it goes on. Look at 5.17 to 48. One of the most famous passages in the Bible because of its complexity of what it's talking about when Jesus talks about how to fulfill the law. Which he says he hasn't come to abolish, but he's come to fulfill it and, and by that transform it. What, and look at these verses in 5.17, especially, sorry, verse 20. I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let that sink in. Having a righteousness that is actually more than the scribes and Pharisees? What you and I have to remember when the, in, in the first century, the Pharisees are the good guys. They are, as the Jesus Storybook Bible says, the extra super holy people. <laughs> right? They fasted two days out of seven. How many of you fasted two days out of seven for the last 20 years? None? Okay. And they, every time they went to Kroger, they brought home immediately and took 10% of everything they bought and gave it to the priests in the temple. They, they gave alms to the poor. They were the good guys. They were the conservatives. They were inerrantists. They were the conservatives, even the fundamentalists of the day. They were not living this loose, crazy life. And for Jesus then to say to tax collectors, fishermen, uneducated people, you need to have a righteousness that is greater than the scribes and the Pharisees, that's not good news. And then if you look, however, in 521 to 48, you'll see that he unpacks exactly what he means by this. That we need to have a righteousness that is not just external, but is internal. That's what goes on in these verses. You know them probably, right? It does, you can't, don't say, or you've heard it said, you shouldn't murder. But Jesus says, if you have hatred in your heart towards others, it doesn't matter if you say, oh, I'm not a murderer. But if your heart is full of hatred, then you're out. Or it doesn't matter if you say, well, we don't commit adultery. I don't commit adultery. But if your heart is marked by this lustfulness, then you're out. This is not godly living. And what Jesus is saying here to them <clears throat> is to the good guys, your righteousness needs to be not just what everybody sees, but a matter again, just like the Beatitudes, of a posture of heart. And then the same thing continues in chapter 6. 
this is what I preached on 18 months or so ago, whenever it was, that Jesus talks about prayer and almsgiving, giving to the poor and fasting. And he says, all these things are good and they're good for you and they're good to do. But if you don't do it with the right heart, it doesn't matter. It's the very same message and it goes on and on all throughout. This is why I like to call it a cardiographic reading of the sermon because when you step back from the mosaic piece, you'll see that it's made of a very clear heart shape in that sense, that this is the focus of the message. Now that all sounds good until we get to chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And all of a sudden, we tend to read it just like the Hungarian poster, that what Jesus is saying here is about behavior. Listen to these verses again. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and few are those who find it. When we read these verses, I think we tend to think of them first of all, as often numeric. So maybe we read it and and, and focus our attention on the fact that there are a lot of people that enter in through this broad way to destruction and there are just a few of us that that are the faithful ones, the ones that are hardcore, that sacrifice, that go on the mission field, that give up the lucrative jobs and do all these things. There's a few of us that do that here. And we think of all the people who are not in church every Sunday, all the people who get to sleep in on Sunday morning, all the people who don't come to chapel and have to do this, they're out there making tons of money. Those are the many that are leading destruction. We're the faithful few. We're the few, and we read it in this numeric way, but I don't think that's the focus. We also tend to read it, I think, in this moral behavior way again. So we think of narrow and wide, narrow and wide as the way, just like the Hungarian poster, this is the loose living. This is doing all these ungodly things, and the narrow, I'm sorry, the broad and, and wide way, and the narrow way is the way of piety, the way of almsgiving, prayer, and fasting, the way of giving to church and tithing and and giving up that great job you could have had and all those sort of things. And of course, there's some truth in that. But you got to step back and think again about to whom Jesus is speaking. He is not speaking to people who live fast and loose, externally immoral lives. He is speaking to the conservatives who don't do all those things. He is speaking to those whose lives look great. And what is he saying? He is saying, that way, my friends, is the way that is easy and broad. In fact, there's sort of details in there you can see. I mean, I think I can argue this just from the English, but if you look at the Greek even, since some of us here know a little Greek, you, you can actually see there's a couple plays on words. The broad way is actually the same word that's used to describe the phylacteries and the, of the Pharisees. And the narrow way is this idea of persecution as well, which goes back to the Beatitudes. But I don't even care if you don't believe that or don't understand that. The point, I think, is very clear as you just read through the sermon. Jesus does not shift gears all of a sudden to moralism and start preaching about behaviors. He is saying the exact same thing he's been saying all through the Sermon on the Mount. That the easy and broad way is the way of the Pharisees. It's the way that looks good on the outside, but is a whitewashed tomb. It is the way that Isaiah spoke of constantly. These people honor me with their lips and their seminary degrees and their posters about all the things we're serious about. Yet our hearts can be far from God, even in the midst of those good things, right? You see, as our brother Andrew Peterson said, the church is the second coming of the Pharisees. And you have to remember that the Gospels were not written so that you and I could be on Jesus' side and say, yeah, I'd love to see Jesus take people down. And then we can sort of take that on as a mantle and the spiritual gift we all have of being a Theo jerk, as I like to call it. The Gospels, when we read the Gospels, what we should be seeing in them, among many other things, is that we of all people are the most like the Pharisees. This is how they function for us now in the church because you see, there is such an ease and a danger and a broadly easy way to hide behind religion of all people. 
that can hide from God the most easily without having a, a, a pricked conscience, it is the ones whose lives are not marked by brokenness openly, but whose lives look good and everybody tells you you look good. We who are like that are in the most danger of not being in right relationship to God from the heart. Not because doing bad things are bad, doing good things are good for us, but they can also blind us just like they did the Pharisees to what really matters that God cares and sees our hearts, our inner person. So friends, I want to suggest to you that it is consistent throughout the Sermon on the Mount, throughout Jesus' teachings, that he is challenging us and calling us to the difficult way of being open before God, not the easy and broad way of having a religion that is focused on externals as good as those things can be in and of themselves. I actually think of another person in Matthew later that had this exact same situation occur and really serves as a foil to this. And that's the rich young ruler, as we call him, from Matthew 19. Do you remember him? If you flip ahead there, you'll see, you don't have to right now, but if you were on your own now or later, you'll see you have a guy who is good. He has done all the Ten Commandments. He's obeyed in every way. And Jesus says something very clever to him that actually goes right back to the Sermon on the Mount. He uses this rare same word, teleos, that is getting at the heart of the matter, no pun intended, which is he says to the man, um, you know, the man has said he's done all these things, but he says to him, if you would be perfect or mature or complete, teleos, Go sell what you possess, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when the man heard this, he went away. Is this saying that we all have to sell everything we have to be, to be in the kingdom of God? In fact, if you read it sort of in a flat-footed way, this would sound some, like some kind of works now, that you have to do these things. So what is he saying? Jesus is the ultimate cardio surgeon. He knows exactly what the issue is. As he says back in chapter 6, where your treasure is, there your will be also. That is, he knows in this case, it's actually physical treasure that is this guy's problem. But whatever it is for you and whatever it is for me, what keeps us from completion, what keeps us from entering the kingdom of heaven is not behavior, it's actually the status of of that inner person, our heart, because that is who we are. And that is the root that bears a tree that bears fruit accordingly, even though there is fake fruit, as Matthew 7, it tells us right after these verses as well. You know, when you think of the Old Testament, I think of a couple characters who come to mind as well. You think of the first two kings of Israel, King Saul and King David. And if you think about their stories and the beautiful way they're interwoven throughout First and Second Samuel, it is amazing to, to be shocked, actually, by recognizing that the difference between these two men, one who ends up being a complete failure and rejected by God, and one who ends up being said, well, and is this the father of this person we're talking about, Jesus, the difference between them is not external behavior. In fact, if you were to make a pro-con list on which is going to be a deacon in our church... Saul is going to win every time, right? What did he do wrong? Well, he got a little nervous under peer pressure and offered a sacrifice about 10 minutes before the prophet came. That was a bummer. And another time, he got a little, a little peer pressure again, and he looked at all the stuff that they had captured, and, and the people were saying, why do we have to destroy this? Can't we just eat this stuff? And he said, you know, you're probably right. Those are his sins, friends. What did David do? Seriously. Saw another man's wife, took him as her own, had a child, and then realized in the midst of that that he was going to get busted, so he had the man killed. And which of them is said, and what is said of David? What is said of David? He is a man after God's own heart. Now, it's not, of course, an invitation to licentiousness or in any ways... Uh, a saying that sins don't matter because they do, and there were consequences for both of them. But it is to say that God, does, as Samuel himself says, God 
Man looks at the outer appearance, but God looks at what? The heart. And I want to say to you, this is an entirely consistent message throughout the Bible, including here. And even though I like the country of Hungary, they got that poster wrong. So what does this mean for you and me? Well, simply, again, God sees and cares about our hearts. And friends, that doesn't sound like good news. And you know what? It's not good news if you're a Pharisee. I want to apply this to us by saying simply that the fact that God sees and cares about our hearts is an invitation for you and I to start paying attention to what's going on in our inner person. That includes our emotions, that includes our motives. Just start paying a little bit more attention to why you're doing what you're doing. For me, I can think of a million ways in which this is a failure in my life. Some years ago, I used to teach a middle school Bible class. I'm not Roman Catholic, but it almost made me believe in purgatory. (laughs) Teaching a middle school Bible class kept me real, for sure. And I had one of those days, most of the days were just trying to get everybody to sit down, but I had one of those days, it was mostly boys, where I actually felt like it went really, really well. Like I went home and thought, wow, we really made progress because I, we were talking about different readings of Genesis 1. I don't know why I thought that would be a good idea to talk about with junior hires with their very nuanced views on everything. But we were, I was talking about just different ways that people have read Genesis 1, the creation accounts throughout history and different views on them and sort of just doing a pro-con evaluation of them with them. And I, they were engaged, they were with me. I thought that was an awesome junior high teaching day. Until the next day, standing on the soccer sidelines at one of my kids' practice, I heard that there was this whole long, big, heated conversation going on among all the mothers about what I had said in class and how mad they all were at me about these very reliable reports that came back from their junior hires, I'm sure. (laughs) And I knew these women. I taught their children, I, we played on soccer teams together, they were always very nice to me, as I was very nice to them. I was livid. I mean, I felt all the shame, I it activated all this stuff in me of wanting to defend myself. I mean, there's nothing worse than being slandered, you feel like people are misrepresenting you. I started to write this email, right, and thankfully my wife said, I don't think you want to send that, so I didn't send that. And, <laughs> And I was just so mad, and I had all the righteous arguments. They should have come to me if they were upset. I'm Dr. Pennington. I mean, you name it, all these little voices coming in my head of all the reasons why I was right and they were wrong. And you know what? I was right and they were wrong at a sort of purely sort of legal level. But thankfully, I'm an upstanding citizen in society. I realized I will take the higher road here and I will not attack them even though I want to. I will take the low road and be misunderstood and try to humbly write them and apologize. So I did that. I took the low road. And I was very proud of myself for taking the low Christian road where I didn't defend myself and it was good. I'm glad I did. If I would have done otherwise, I would have made a fool of myself. But friends, it wasn't enough. I found myself over the next several days, as I paid attention to my heart, I couldn't avoid it actually, that even though I had done the right Christian thing, that's not what God cared about. I was angry, I was full of desire to destroy, desire to defend myself. What God saw and cared about was more than my good, civilly recognized Christian decisions of behavior, he saw and cared about what was going on inside of me. And that's what he wanted to transform. What about you? Is there something that happened this morning? Last week? Maybe there's somebody on the other side of the chapel that hurt you deeply with some offhand words they don't even know about. Or maybe somebody really hurt you. Or maybe there's somebody you can think of in the past that is, that is, you feel full of anger or lust or you, you name it. Any of these things that Jesus brings up or any others. 
I want to invite you to say that God sees and cares about the inner person. And again, friends, that is not good news until you turn that sweet corner to say and to understand that the God who sees and cares about our hearts loves you. Let that sink in. The God who sees and cares about the hearts of you and me in all their wickedness, lustful, hateful thoughts before you stand in the pulpit, before you in the middle of serving communion, whatever you're doing, God sees that and says, friend, child, I love you. And so that means for us, don't hide anymore. Don't cover up your broken, wicked insides with a bunch of religiosity that is just building walls between you and God. Instead, be open to God fully and say, God, I am broken and I am not a teleos. I am not a whole person. There is so much inconsistency in my life, so much brokenness, and that's what you see and care about. And in the context of him welcoming you, Come, friends, to the freedom that is found there. There is so much freedom to be found in being completely honest on the inside. That is the place of freedom. You do not have to live in the bondage of trying to do a bunch of good stuff. Find the freedom of knowing that the Father sees the depths of your heart and loves you and welcomes you and sends the Holy Spirit to change that part of you which then will bear the fruit that you want to pursue. It is an invitation to freedom, friends. An invitation to the narrow road that does lead to life. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you are transforming us into your beautiful image. That is what we long for. Please fill us with the Spirit. There might be some here today, God, who are unsure of whether they even believe anymore. Some are doubting today. God, would you come by the Holy Spirit and be sweet to them and comfort them? And maybe there's some deep deep wound or deep uh, shame that is keeping them from being honest with you. Would you come by the Holy Spirit now, God, and heal? And we pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.